In this video, we're going to begin our discussion of chained hashing. To begin this discussion, we are going to primarily just be talking about the methods and how we implement them. First, let's remind us what the idea of chained hashing was. We have our hash table. And then at each location in that hash table, what we're going to do is we're going to have a linked list of values. Sometimes those linked lists may be empty. Sometimes they may only have one element. Sometimes they may have many, many elements in them. So this is our idea for chained hashing. We have some hash table and we are storing the elements, the key value pairs in the various locations. And if we have a collision in the hash table, the way we resolve that collision is by appending it to the linked list at that location. So. The implementations here are a bit pseudocody, but that's totally fine. As long as we, when we analyze it, we remember that we might be sweeping some details under the rug in what we are doing. So in order to add an element, insert it into the hash table, the way we're going to do that is we're going to take our key and our data as input. We are then going to find the location in the hash table that our hash function hashes to for that key. Then we're just simply going to append our key value pair into the linked list at that location. Having done so, we have added it to the list. So that's nice and straightforward. Our second method, we're going to have to determine if something is in the hash table. As always, we are going to need to compute what the hash of our key is. And then we're going to determine is that key in the linked list at that location? If so, then we return true. If it's not, we return false. Relatively straightforward implementation. Retrieve will be very similar. The only difference is we are going to retrieve that element KD from the linked list and then return the data. So these are all relatively straightforward. And as long as we can understand a couple of properties here, we can definitely analyze these functions. So let's begin by analyzing, well, how good is this implementation? Looking up our insert method, we always need to perform this hash and then we need to append something to a linked list. Hopefully you remember that linked lists are very good at adding new elements to them. All you need to do is create a new node in the linked list and then potentially hook up a couple of pointers. If it's doubly linked, you may need to add a couple of pointers there and you may need to move the head or tail pointer depending on how you implemented this. But you only need to do some very basic operations. So all of these operations, insertion into a linked list is constant and so is our hash function, hopefully. Depending on your hash function, that may actually not be true, but we are going to assume that it is. So insertion is in theta of one for both the best case and the worst case, which means that also the expected case. So that is really good. We can add things to the hash table very effectively. Now we need to determine if something is in the hash table. And here we've hid a lot of information from us. We have this very convenient looking phrase here. K is in a linked list. As if that's just such an easy thing to check, right? So we've hit all of the details from everybody here. So how can we actually do that? Well, what we need to do is one of the downsides of linked lists would be that in order to determine if something is in it, you need to iteratively search through everything at once. So we do not have random access into the linked list, so we can't store it in sorted order or anything like this our only real method here is going to be to search through the linked list. So our best case would be that the linked list, our best case, there's two options, either the linked list at HI has one element or zero elements. If it has one element, then that one element will hopefully be k, and therefore we would return true. If it has zero elements, we would return false, but we don't need to scan through this list. So in this case, we don't need to do any scanning through any linked lists, and we are very thankful for that. So this would be in theta of one. Our worst case, we might need to think about what's happening here. So for our worst case, let's draw a picture of what would happen. Let's suppose I have a hash table of size m, meaning that it has m elements in which I can store data, so there are m linked lists. 
In addition to that, let's also claim that we have n things in the linked list. Assume hash table has n elements. Notice we have two notions of size here, how big the hash table is and how many elements have been inserted into it. When you create a new hash table, you need to reserve space for the array by default, but you've not added anything to it, so you can't possibly have any collisions occurring. However, once you've inserted elements, you have these potential collisions and you have potentially linked lists of various lengths throughout this hash table. So with this in mind, what is our worst case? Our worst case is a picture that looks like this. We have our hash table, H, and at one location, every single element is in that location. We have some weirdly stacked hash table here where every single thing we have hashed has given us a collision. This would be very unfortunate, but it is our worst case. So our worst case is all elements in the same location or in the same linked list. If that were to occur, we, we would might potentially have to scan through that entire linked list. So not only do we need to assume for our worst case that all elements are in the same linked list, we need to assume that our element we are looking for, the one that has key K, is at the final location or not in that linked list. If that's the case, we would need to scan through all of the elements of the linked list. And this is why we have two notions of size. If we have N elements inserted, we need to scan through all N elements. We do not need to scan through the hash table though. All we need to do is hash to the location of that linked list and then scan through it. To begin analyzing the expected time, what we really need to be able to do is we need to be able to understand how long are the linked lists on average, whatever we mean by on average. Because the runtime of this is primarily inhibited by running through that linked list. That is the primary determining factor. So we're going to try to understand what is the expected length of the linked lists within this hash table. Naively, you might want to say, well, if I have n things that I have inserted and there are m possible places I could have inserted them, then maybe it's like n out of m. That seems like a totally reasonable guess, right? If you have five things that you've inserted in a thousand locations, five out of a thousand seems like a reasonable guess. If you have 10,000 things that you've inserted and a thousand lists, a thousand locations, then 10,000 out of 1,000 might be what you might expect. So this seems like a reasonable guess if things are well behaved, but that's not really mathematical. So to analyze the expected time, let's do that off on its own. And we'll need to formally figure out how can we say what is the expected length of the linked list. Here, we're going to determine what is the expected length of the linked list. So that's our question. What is the expected length of the linked lists. If we can understand that, we can presumably understand the runtime here. We're going to use some probability they may not have seen before, but hopefully won't be too bad. We're going to introduce what we're going to call an indicator variable, x i comma j. What this indicator variable will tell us, it's going to be a random variable that says whether or not element j is in location i. So this is a, going to be something that says be true or one if h of kj, the jth key, is equal to i. So that says that element kj with whatever data is in location i. So let's write that down just so we can remember. This says that element kj dj is in h at location i. We return zero otherwise, so zero else. Now the question is, why on earth did I describe this stupid thing? How is this going to be helpful to us? So what we're actually going to do is define a different variable. We're going to define xi is equal to the sum 
from j equals 1 to n of that variable. What on earth did we just define? Well, what that's going to tell us is how many elements are in location i. That is what xi is designed to compute. So if we can find the expected value of xi, that would tell us the expected number of things in location i. And now we've wrangled from some strange nebulous problem that we may maybe couldn't understand to something much more tactical. This value xi will tell us the number of elements at location i. Let's write that down so we know what this is. The number of elements at hi. So if we find the expected value of xi, that is the expected length of the linked list at location i. Hopefully it will not depend on i because we assume, let's hope, that our functions are well behaved. So what we really want to compute is the expected value of xi, which, let's write this down, it looks like it's going to be a nightmare. This is the expected value of the sum from j equals 1 to n of xi comma j. But now we remember that the expectation is a linear operator, and therefore I can swap the expected value in the summation here. So I get the sum from j equals 1 to n of the expected value of xi comma j. And the nice thing about ex this value, the expected value of xij is xij only has two possible outcomes, and therefore computing its expected value should be easy. Now, expected value of xi comma j is equal to, I have two outcomes. I have one times the probability that the thing that I get one is true, which is h of k sub j is equal to i, plus zero times the probability that it is not equal to i. h of k j is not equal to i. One thing convenient is already happening, which is that this second term is going to just be zero. I have no interest in what that probability is. And now we need to make some assumptions because we have this strange probability. How likely is it that an arbitrary key, k j, I've said nothing about what k j is, how likely is that 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 arbitrary key gets mapped to location i? Let's make an assumption. We're going to assume that this probability h of k j is equal to i is equal to 1 over m, that all locations are equally likely for an arbitrary key to get hashed to. This is a very reasonable assumption if we chose a good hash function, which is why it's critically important in applications that you choose a good hash function to make this assumption. With that in mind, we suddenly have a very convenient expression here. We have the expected value of xi comma j is equal to 1 times 1 over m, which is just 1 over m. Therefore, let's use that information up here. If the expected value of xij is 1 over m, then we have that this is the sum from j equals 1 to n of 1 over m. And that is a very convenient summation. We're adding up something that has nothing to do with j a fixed number of times. So this is equal to n over m. Therefore, the expected time of this method, the expected time is equal to a constant times the expected value of xi plus some constant. Why do we write it this way? We write it this way because if we look back up what we were doing, we always perform some sort of constant time operations, such as hashing and maybe returning. So those always occur. And then we also need to iterate through this, this list. There is no way around that. So this is exactly what we saw with some of our gambling problems we looked at earlier. So with that in mind, this is equal to C times N over M plus C. And we're going to write this runtime in a bit of a funny way. We're going to say that E T of N is in 
theta of 1 plus n over m. To emphasize that even when the array is empty, it still takes constant time just to sort of separate out those two values. Notice there is no way to simplify this because we don't know anything about n or m. They could be anything at all for this problem, and therefore we must express the runtime like this. However, this is very convenient if n is relatively small. Like, let's say that n is equal to twice m even. If that was the case, we would have theta of 3. Very reasonable. So, even if you have twice as many elements in your hash table as you have spots available, this still seems like a very reasonable algorithm. So this is the expected time for our member function. And it is identical to do the same thing for the retrieve function because the way that this code works is that the thing that is inhibiting it and the thing that is governing the expected times is the length of those linked lists and the expected length is going to be n over m. So let's write this down just to finish everything off. The expected time here is theta of one plus n over m. And the expected time here is the same. And similarly, the best case over here will be theta of one and the worst case will be theta of n. There are a couple of other methods that we should mention. We will use these maybe sometimes in the class when we're using hash tables and applications. The first one of these is that you might want to modify the data being stored at a particular location. Here we have an add function that lets us add x to whatever thing is stored at key k. So we find out whatever is stored at that location and then just add x to it. Similarly, we might want to replace something that is, again, very simple. All we need to do is find the element and then set the data at that element to our new data. These will take the exact same complexity as the previous methods that we have discussed.